Hi everybody and welcome back to Miss Angler's Biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video we are going to do a continuation on transport through plants. Our previous video was on the apoplastic route that water follows. Now we're going to look at the sister to this which is the symplastic route. Now if you are new here don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed with your notifications turned on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday for grade 10 to 12 life sciences. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you haven't watched the apoplastic route, then you should watch that uh, first, and I'm going to link that up above now. Or if you need a full introduction to plants as well, I'm also going to link that video throughout here. Um, and make sure to keep your eyes on missangler.co.za because you can now get your copy of the cheat sheet for grade 10 life sciences. Trust me, guys. This is like your saving grace. It's the thing that you've been wanting more than anything because it simplifies the content and it makes it really easy to study. Now to dive into this topic on the symplastic route, we do need to do a little bit of revision on the cell structure. Um, and right at the beginning of the year, you would have learned that the different structures that we see in cells and in particular plant cells. And we need to focus in on this structure over here called the plasmasmata. Now this structure is really important for this process because it is a phenomenon where we have two plant cells. So here's cell one and cell two but they have an opening in between them over here which is called the plasmodesma now the plasmodesma or the plasmodesmata is just the plural of that basically it is an opening that allows cytoplasm to be shared with neighboring cells so that means that if there are any nutrients that are building up in this cytoplasm they are shared and can be shared with the next door neighbor by simply moving through this space now, what this enables water to do is to easily move from one cell to the next and actually also to allow for diffusion to take place. Now, let's just run through a couple of things about the symplastic route. The first thing that I want you to take note of is when does the symplastic route occur? This is when we have normal conditions. Now, what do normal conditions mean? Well, that means that the plant has enough water, um, even though it might be sunny that day, the water balance is equal of what it's absorbed versus what it's lost. Maybe the day is normal in the sense that there's not too much wind, not too little, so there's not too much transpiration. And so essentially, when we do the symplastic route, we are looking at a plant that's living in pretty stable conditions, or we could also call them adequate conditions. And when we do go through the symplastic route, I want you to know that when you are moving through the cytoplasm from one cell to the next, you are not going to move very quickly. So I would say that this is the second slowest route. The slowest route would be the vacuolar route where you move from one vacuole to the next. We haven't done that one yet. The fastest route is definitely when you move through the cell wall, which we've already done in the apoplastic route. We would use this route because we don't want to lose too much or too little water because right now we're in normal conditions. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. Now, it's a very simple idea um, about how it moves, and it still follows the same order that we would see in our apoplastic route. First things first, we're going to follow the black arrows on this diagram, and we're going to start moving through the epidermis. So that is step one. We're going to move through from the root hair cell, and we're going to move into the cortex cells. But instead of going along the cell wall, you will notice here that we are moving through the plasmids mata into the cortex, and then from the cortex, we go into the endodermis. Now, remember the endodermis has this strip over here. Remember, it is called the Kasparian strip. And it is waterproof. And remember, the waterproof um, ability forces water to then enter into the pericycle and into the xylem. And so we want that strip to be there because if you were water traveling along the cell wall, as you can see here in yellow, if you go along the cell wall, you'll eventually be forced to go into the, epi uh, the endodermis, excuse me. 
And that is forced because of the Kasparan strip. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we are going to move our water through into the pericycle and then eventually into the xylem. But another thing I must remind you of is you are constantly maintaining water potential. And just to remind you one more time about why water potential uh, is important and what is it, that is when you are moving from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential. And you are constantly doing that. If you don't maintain a high on one side and a low on the other, water will stop moving. And so on this diagram, the xylem will always have a low water potential and the epidermis will always have a high water potential. How do we maintain that? Well, we maintain that through the vacuole because the vacuole inside the epidermis keeps the water potential high by storing it. And how do we maintain the low water potential in the xylem? Well, that is when we actively pump out ions, or maybe your teacher has called them salts, into the xylem, and that makes the xylem salty. Where does it come from, everybody? It comes from the endodermis. The endodermis is the one that produces these ions. And so if I change over color, the endodermis is secreting out salts into the pericycle like that. And then, of course, into the xylem because they diffuse. They go from a high concentration to a low. And because of this high concentration of salt, water is attracted to it. So it's going to move towards that low potential of water. And they work in the opposite, by the way. So if the water potential is high or low, then the ion level is the opposite. So if I write the ions um, in red, when the water is high, the ions are low. And when the water potential is low, the ions are high. Okay. Now you will notice that this is low to high, which is why we use active transport. Remember, we have to move against the concentration gradient. Now, as always, I like to finish off my lessons with a very quick terminology recap. There are only really three terms that we need to know for this section, starting off with the plasmosomata. This is those little connection points between neighboring plant cells where they share cytoplasm. The next thing we need to speak about, uh, which, which is a very important term word that we must use in our answers, we don't just want to say an area of high and an area of low. We want to use the word concentration gradient. That is when you are moving substances down or against a gradient, either passively via diffusion or actively via active transport. You must know how to use those words correctly in your explanations. Now, in order to create the concentration gradient, we need the Kasparan strip to keep the water within the cells. Because if we didn't have the Kasparan strip, the water would not be affected by the salts. Therefore, it won't be affected by the concentration gradient and we wouldn't be able to maintain a constant flow of water into the cell and then into the xylem. Now, if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed because I'm constantly posting new grade 10 work and I will see you all again soon. Bye.